What an awesome book of the Bible. I mean, I really hope that last week you really saw some of the background of these strange and almost arbitrary laws, which were important for Ruth and to her mother-in-law. You see, as the people obeyed them and lived by them, God worked through them. But what faith did you notice from Ruth? She really is a remarkable woman. She left her own family, she left her own culture, she trusted in the laws and the culture of the land that she went to in Bethlehem. As Boaz said, she had taken shelter under the wings of the God of Israel. And that is a very important thing to remember as we move on into chapter three this week. Today, we're gonna to watch Ruth's faith and her incredible love and see a little bit more about how this Redeemer law works out in practice so that we can grow in our faith in our Redeemer too. Well, I'm Andrew. I'm one of the pastors here at the Living Room Church. Welcome to our talk time. Well, let's move on into chapter three. Let's read verses one through to the end of verse five. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not seek rest for you, that it may be well with you? Is not Boaz our relative, with whose young women you were? See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Wash, therefore, and anoint yourself, and put on your cloak, and go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. You see, everything that happened in the last chapter, you may have noticed, happened for all to see out in the open. Every decision was exposed and instructions given so that everyone knew exactly what was happening. And God worked through it all to bring this poor and starving family some protection and some food. Now in chapter three, it's very similar to the structure of chapter two and the giving of instructions and then going, carrying out those instructions and then reporting back what happens. And we have the care and the protection of Boaz that we're gonna see again here in chapter three, but everything that is done in this chapter is done in private, it's discreet. And in fact, we could even say it's very romantic. Naomi had a prayer way back in chapter one. Do you remember it? Let me read this for you. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of your husband. It's one of the few recorded prayers that we find in this book. And certainly from a human point of view, it seemed to Naomi and probably to us, we have to admit, that the only way that it would be fulfilled would be if Ruth returned to Moab and married somebody else. And when they returned to Bethlehem, that prayer really was starting to be answered. Ruth happened to glean in the field belonging to a close relative called Boaz, who would become the family redeemer for Naomi and Ruth. Someone who would be able to ensure that the inheritance that belonged to Naomi would not leave her family. And Naomi's family line would continue it's important to keep inheritance with families as much then as it is now. But as we will see soon, family lines were particularly important. Even more on that next week. Naomi might have prayed that Ruth be blessed with a home and a husband of her own, but she doesn't sit back. She's proactive now that she's realized that Boaz is, of course, that he's around and eligible too. So look at verse one again. Should I not seek rest for you? Now, rest is an Old Testament way of describing home and family. Uh, in this case, of course, it's a husband that Naomi desires for her. Her plan is that Ruth would go and freshen herself up uh, and put on some perfume and then wait until the folks who've been working hard for their dinner are settling down for the night. Oh, and, and make sure that you find the right one, Ruth. Don't um, do all this for the wrong man. That's in verse four. But when he lies down, observe the place where he lies, then go and uncover his feet and lie down and he will tell you what to do. And she replied, all that you say, I will do. Now, hold on a wee minute. 
uncover his feet. I mean, that has to be a really cultural thing, doesn't it? I mean, if Carol were trying to impress me or the other way around, the last thing that I would do would be to pull back the, the duvet covers over her feet. Uh, let's reread a verse that we saw actually last week in Ezekiel and chapter 16 and verse 8. When I passed by you again and you saw, behold, you were the age for love. And I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your nakedness. I made my vow to you and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Lord, and you became mine. Now, in that parable in Ezekiel in chapter 16, Ezekiel explains that actually this is God and his people Israel, pictured as a husband and as a, a wife. And so we have this covering that is spread over Israel, this covering being like um, like a wing, literally, actually, we've seen. Um, and Israel's pictured as a woman. This is very much like a marriage proposal. We see that vow language, the covenant language. God enters into a marriage pact with Israel. So culturally, what Naomi is telling Ruth to go and to ask Boaz to do is to enter into marriage with her. In fact, um, we can say that just as Ruth has chosen to follow God, the true God of Israel, she's also choosing to offer herself in a binding marriage contract with Boaz. This is about a permanent rest for Ruth, both in home and in protection and family. God is answering Naomi's prayer through Naomi herself. So let's read on and let's see how effective this was. Let's read verse 6 through to the end of verse 15. So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of a heap of grain. Then she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight, the man was startled and turned over and behold, a woman lay at his feet. He said, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant for you are a redeemer. And he said, may you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first in that you have not gone after young men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask, for all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. And now it is true that I am a redeemer, and yet there is a redeemer nearer than I. Remain tonight and in the morning, if he will redeem you, good. Let him do it. But if he is not willing to redeem you, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Lie down until the morning. So she lay at his feet until the morning, but arose before one could recognise another. And he said, Let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. And he said, Bring the garment you are wearing and hold it out. So she held it, and he measured out six measures of barley and put it on her. Then she went into the city. Okay, so Boaz is falling asleep on the threshing floor. It's midnight. It sounds as though he's a little bit away from the other men, giving that little bit of privacy for himself. And he's full of food and he is merry. Now, probably that means that he was a little tipsy because there are much better and far more specific words for drunk in the original Hebrew language, if that is what the writer of Ruth had intended for us to understand. But this is when Ruth makes her move. Uh, and she's in an all-male environment, remember, at this workplace threshing hold, and that makes her very vulnerable. And Boaz knows this, of course, as we see in verse 14. His own reputation is on the line as well as her reputation. Is he the worthy and the noble man that the writer of Ruth claimed him to be all the way back in chapter 2? Well, it has been said that the reference to uncovering feet has a suggestion of something more sexual. But Ruth, in verse 8, is literally lying at Boaz's feet. Then we get that astounding verse 9. Verse 9, which says, 
I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. Ruth's ready to do whatever Boaz tells her to do. Wanting the coverage of Boaz's marriage, willing to submit herself to this Israelite law and for Boaz to redeem her family. Now, in that first chapter, Naomi actually had a prayer. The prayer that Ruth might have rest, find a husband and a home. In chapter 2, do you remember, Boaz also had a prayer for Ruth. Let's read chapter 2 and verse 12. The Lord repay you for what you have done and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Remember, we looked and saw that the wings is the corner of the garment. This is a symbolic thing that actually is testifying to something much bigger than what's going on. The Lord repay you. Um, You've come to take refuge under wings. Can you see this amazing answer to Boaz's prayer literally happening right here? Spreading wings, spreading the corner of a garment. Ezekiel's parable of the spreading of that garment is the same meaning that we find right here. Spreading wings. It's an act of protection. It's an act of commitment. And of course, it's an act of warmth. Boaz's prayer was that Ruth find protection from God. And what Ruth is asking Boaz to provide is that that specific committed protection for her. And then she adds that wonderful phrase that resonates so much with us. You are a redeemer. Now, as we saw last week, that close relative redeemer had a financial responsibility to help to keep an inheritance within the family. The redeemer had the privilege and the responsibility to act on behalf of a relative who was in trouble or dead or in danger or in need. But Boaz goes on to say something that we really could clearly misunderstand here. I I think I probably did the first time I read it too. And that's verse 10. Your last kindness is greater than the first in that you have not gone after other men. Now, on first glance, a superficial reading of this, we might think that that means that Ruth's proposition to Boaz is a kindness because Boaz is old and maybe Boaz isn't particularly eligible and maybe he's not married because he doesn't look like George Clooney after all. Um, and maybe he's just flattered. That's what it could mean, but it really doesn't mean that. Ruth could have gone after somebody richer and younger, of course, but this is a last kindness, which means that it's in, ki- in, in the same way as the first kindness. Now, what is the first kindness? Well, once again, you have to marvel that things are written in this book specifically and carefully and in, in very, very good detail to help us to unpack and to understand what the first kindness was to see what the second kindness is. So let's read chapter 2 and verse 11. But Boaz answered her, all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me and how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. So the first kindness is that Ruth went to care for her mother-in-law and didn't abandon her and go back to her own family in Moab. This is Ruth's kindness. She submitted herself to Naomi's direction and committed herself to care for Naomi. Now he sees this love expressed once again as Ruth has followed her mother-in-law's instructions and seeks to help to keep Naomi's family inheritance intact within the family using the Redeemer. This is a second kindness to Naomi. She intends to raise an heir for Naomi and protect the family inheritance because that was also the role of the Redeemer. Ruth has the deepest of love for her Naomi, enough that to look to this older man, to marry her, to keep Naomi's inheritance intact, we could almost say that the greatest love that we can see within this book is the love between Ruth and Naomi. And Boaz is willing. Praise the Lord, he is a worthy man. And Ruth is known here in this chapter as a worthy woman, a noble woman, of course, in this case, because she wasn't rich. But there is a complication, and Boaz will have to sort this complication out. But we're going to need to wait until next week to find out what that complication is. 
And so just to end off these verses in particular, their reputations are left untarnished. They haven't done anything had um, they haven't done anything they shouldn't have during the night. They're not married yet. Um, this interchange hasn't been seen, but if it had have been, then maybe people would have made allegations, but they've kept their nobility intact. And if Ruth had tried to go home in the middle of the night, she could have been attacked by somebody wandering the road. She would have been in danger herself, but staying with Boaz, he wants to make sure that she is kept safe and leaves before anybody else wakes up. No scandal. God is answering Boaz's prayer too. And now we'll finish up uh, the chapter with verses 16 through to the end of verse 18. Let's read those ones. And when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, how did you fare my daughter? And she told her all that the man had done for her saying, these six measures of barley he gave to me. And he said to me, you must not go back empty handed to your mother-in-law. She replied, wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out, for the man will not rest, but will settle the matter today. Ruth, of course, wants to know if the plans worked. Of course she does. And you can imagine the scene. Um, no time for a wedding ring. Boaz has given a generous gift, if a little unglamorous. Um, he's given a symbol of what Naomi really needs, of course. Remember way back in chapter one, she arrived penniless. In fact, in verse 21, she described herself as being brought back empty. In chapter two, Naomi and Ruth are provided for. Here in chapter three, they're now overflowing with food. But there was another thing that Naomi was concerned about. And our verses here have only partially fulfilled Naomi's desire. Naomi is, of course, concerned about inheritance. And that word, uh, to us might simply mean the estate that is left behind after somebody dies. But in the Old Testament, it's something that goes on from generation to generation. Land would stay within a family for generations to enjoy. And not only does Naomi want uh, a husband for Ruth, she wants Ruth to go on to have that inheritance too, and then to pass that on to the generations to come. In fact, at the beginning of this book, we saw some generations. We saw a father and two sons. They were from Bethlehem. And you can read on, of course, into chapter four, and the book will end with another set of generations of ancestors. Naomi wants grandchildren. She wants Ruth to experience what it is to be a mother, as she was. And we have to sit in awe of how God is working. We looked at that so much last week, even though some would wonder how God can work in difficult and desperate situations like family death, for example, or financial difficulty, for example. God can work all things for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. He's been working through the legal practices in Israel as they obey his laws with um, God in mind, living with integrity, as we can see here. God's legal requirements weren't simply to be a bunch of laws that would keep people safe, although of course they would do that, or simply to help them flourish, although of course they would do that too. <clears throat> they are there to reflect the character of God. They're not just there for us, they're there to show us how God cares and how God loves. And so how he wants to bless and how he wants to protect and how he wants to be just and how he wants to care. That's what those laws also do. They show how pure and perfect God really is. And as we remember that this is, a, is set during the time of the judges, when people did what was right, remember, in their own eyes, we have found a law-keeping man who doesn't realise what God is up to. In the Redeemer's obedience, this Redeemer Boaz's obedience, he is exceptional in his time. In chapter 2, we saw the character of that Redeemer Boaz. He's a man who protects and who provides. Here in chapter 3, we have witnessed Ruth's faith in that Redeemer. She could so easily have been taken advantage of. She could have been spurned. She could have been cast out. But this is where the book of Ruth begins to reveal to us the character of our Redeemer, of course. Our Redeemer who provides for us and who protects us. 
A little like in Ruth, uh, we are the outsiders. We are foreigners to God's ways. Moab, of course, was a famous enemy of God's people. Without God, we are his enemies too. Because if we've not come to shelter under the wings of God, the corner of the garment of God, literally, then we are exposed to the just punishment of God. We are unprotected. And without God, we would not be provided with such a great salvation, such blessings like being brought in to be part of a family and given an inheritance. And the wonderful thing that Boaz reveals to us is that when we come and ask our Redeemer for shelter and take shelter in him, just as Boaz says, I will do for you all that you ask. When we come to our Redeemer, Jesus, for forgiveness of our sins, he also says to us, I will never cast out. He is willing to forgive the truly repentant person. I was reading in a book last week, completely unrelated to what we're looking at and studying here, that you cannot find in the whole of the Bible a single person who was repentant and God turned them away. We also can have faith in our Redeemer, no matter what we have done, no matter how much we might hate ourselves for what we have done. We can come to Jesus when we're truly sorry for what we have done, who will be our Redeemer for us who are in trouble, danger and need to. Just like Ruth had to go to the Redeemer, we have to go to our Redeemer and ask him to spread his wings of protection and comfort over us and be willing to be our Redeemer's servant too. Will you do that? Will you dare to go to Jesus? And you can do that in the privacy of your own home or your quiet place or your favorite place to be alone or, or you're even in your head. And you can put your trust in him to save you and be your redeemer. Will you risk being mocked by others and humbling yourself at the feet of the one who had nails driven into them as well as into his hands for you because you can and if you do he will not push you away but he will welcome you and he will love you and he will fill you with his holy spirit just to guarantee that you are his i really hope that that's what you want so would you pray with me right now? Lord, we just want to thank you so much for what we see in chapter three of Ruth. It really is a picture of what we need to do to come to you, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Lord, to, to be willing to risk it all, to throw ourselves at your feet, at your mercy. For you, Lord, are the truest Redeemer. You are the true, noble, worthy Redeemer, the one who is rich in all purity and in blessing. And Lord, the one that we need to take shelter under. Lord, thank you that you do not cast out the willing and repentant sinner. Lord, thank you that we can become part of your family. Thank you that you are a near relative and that you, God the Son, took on flesh and you became a human being like us, yet you were found without sin. And so, Lord, our Heavenly Father has put you in the heavenly places, raised you up, that at, at, your, at your name every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that you are Lord to the glory of our Heavenly Father. Thank you that we can see this echoed so marvellously here in chapter three of this book of Ruth. And Lord, we just want to pray for one another. Lord, we just want to thank you that you are so merciful. We want to thank you that we can go to you no matter what we have done. And I just want to pray for anybody who's been listening to this, who's just thinking, but how could I do that after living a life ignoring God? How could I do that with the thoughts that I have? How could I do that with the things that I'm so ashamed that I've done in the past? Lord, when somebody is truly sorry for those things, you do not cast them away, but Lord, you welcome them. And so I pray, Lord, that you will give someone the confidence, give somebody the, the bravery, the courage to be able to come to you, the Redeemer, to ask for forgiveness and follow you. Lord, I pray this for your honour and for your glory, for you are worthy to be praised. 
So we pray all of these things in the name of our Lord and our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, once again, thank you so much for joining us today. And we've one more chapter to finish off Ruth next week. God bless you.